Thank you. Um, let me tell, me tell you a bit about myself. I uh, received a diagnosis of what back then was called Asperger's syndrome. It was about 25 years ago. At that time, I thought uh, I got it late. Now I think I was very young because I'm 53 now. Um, I don't meet any of the criteria for autism anymore. And actually, I don't think I had autism. I think I had something very similar to autism. And I will just leave that as a cliffhanger, and I will get back to that later. Uh, OK, uh, this uh, experience uh, with the diagnosis led me into working in the autism field, because I found it very fascinating, and I still do. Um, so I have now, uh, as was mentioned, worked for, for about 20 years as a staff counselor, among other things, and educator. And I have been keeping on writing books. And uh, the last one, Secret to Success for Professionals in the Autism Field, is the last one in English, and that's the one I will be talking about. It's, you could say, it's the experience I made as a staff counselor. And when I reviewed coming here um, the title of my presentation, I was thinking now, maybe I won't tell you what the most important tools are and how to use them. Uh, I will tell you something, uh, some of the important tools, and maybe more of why to use them, or that we should use them. And I wrote um, in the short text about my presentation that I might not tell you something new, but I hope I will tell you some old things maybe in a new way. Uh, because what I see is we have lots of knowledge of autism today in my country, in Sweden, but we don't always do <laughs> uh, or practice that knowledge. Uh, the Sweden, in Sweden we say we are a consensus culture, we want to agree on everything. The typical Swedish staff meeting is that we sit together and discuss at length what intervention or what tool we should use, and we can't stop discuss until everyone agrees. And then we agree on using this, and then nobody does that. <laughs> I'm not saying this happens all the time, but too often it does. Uh, so as a staff counselor, I, I actually became interested in developing professionalism, because I think everybody who is professional want to develop their professional. Uh, their prof professionalism. Okay, so <clears throat> I noticed that lots of staff has lots of theoretical knowledge, but they don't know how to put that in pr into practice. Um, and I realized that sometimes it is because they don't know how, but sometimes, or even more often, it's because they don't know why. And if you don't know why, you tend to just not do it. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> um, my point here uh, is that working in the autism field, being a professional in the autism field, is much like any craftsmanship. Uh, uh, because first of all, if you're a craftsman, you need to understand the importance of the preparatory work that you have to prepare for your work. Um, as a comparison, if you have a painter, uh, a painter probably don't spend even half of their time actually painting. Uh, a painter will start by covering the surfaces to make sure he or she doesn't spill anything, um, and then perhaps removing all, old paint, uh, sanding, putty, and so on, and then paint. And the end result is very dependent on how well you do your uh, preparations. And uh, <clears throat> my picture in autism is that uh, many staff I meet, they uh, rather run around and try to rescue things that went wrong <laughs> after uh, the fact than prepare for uh, things that could happen. So I think that's an important tool, actually, uh, one of the most important tools to, to do your prepar preparatory work. I can't even translate uh, or uh, say that in English, I'm sorry. Um, the other thing we need, just like a craftsman, we need a, a, a toolbox uh, with several tools. And some tools are mandatory if you work in autism. 
uh, and uh, some tools you can choose to have uh, depending on the level of disability your client or student, student has, uh, your profession, etc. Uh, one of the most known mandatory tools, I would say, is to use visual aids. Everybody knows that if we work in the autism field, we should use visual aids, right? Uh, such as pictures, symbols, drawings, text even for those who can read. Um, still, what I see, especially when it comes to clients with autism who don't have a learning disability, this is not used often enough. Uh, and it's rarely a question of staff not knowing how, it's that they don't know why. Uh, so, let's make the connection between the theory and the practice. Because everybody knows about theory of mind, right? Um, everybody is here, I'm sure. Uh, still, I meet staff, even if they know everything theoretical about the problems that you can have with theory of mind or mentalization when you have autism, they can be upset uh, over a person with autism behaving in a, in a certain way, in a certain situation. Uh, for example, when a person with autism uh, who, who just flatly denies having done something that's obvious to, to everybody, everybody. So let me tell you about um, an example from my son. My son does not have autism. And when he was three years old, uh, he, uh, I, we were out in the garden and he went inside uh, and he didn't come out again. So I went inside looking for him, calling him, he didn't answer. And um, I looked around and then I saw that uh, there was a, a package of cookies op open <laughs> and uh, I saw crumbles on the floor. So I just followed the crumbles and I found my son with his mouth full of cookies behind the sofa. And I asked him, it was a rather stupid question actually, but I asked him, did you take cookies? <laughs> and he said, no, with the mouth full of cookies. I was not upset because he was three years old. So why should I be upset? He can't see the situation from my perspective, right? Uh, what I, I realized was just about a year later, when he was four, those situations did not happen anymore. Uh, it's not that he just became uh, very uh, compliant and never did anything he shouldn't, uh, certainly not. But if I caught him doing something he shouldn't have done, he would not just flatly deny, he would start arguing with me. And to argue, of course, you need a language, but not just a language, you also need the development of theory of mind to take someone else's perspective and think what argument may this person, my mother in this case, buy into. Uh, uh, so he would say things like, I was so hungry and you weren't here, so I couldn't ask. Um, so, um, what I see um, uh, in, in uh, staff who, who work in autism is that although they know uh, that fear of mind, the development is delayed in many individuals with autism, not to say that you can't develop fear of mind if you have autism, but it's often delayed. Uh, I still see them be, uh, becoming upset when, uh, say, a student, uh, 15 years old, in a regular school with autism would flatly deny having done something that everybody else knows he has done. To me, he or she, that student, is just three years old in that respect, not three years old all, all over, but in this area. So there's no need for becoming upset. Um, however gifted this person is uh, uh, otherwise. Of course, to flatly deny something doesn't mean you have autism. Uh, actually, a very famous uh, denial is, uh, I did not have sexual relationships with that woman. <laughs> Bill Clinton, uh, and I don't think he has troubles with theory of mind, of course. Uh, but the thing is that when we, everybody, when we are under a lot of pressure, we, lo we lose our mature strategies, right? So, uh, but that's another thing. I'm talking here about people with autism who hasn't uh, developed those strategies yet. Uh, I think theory of mind is actually uh, crucial to the uh, and its development uh, is crucial because it steers so much of what we do. 
uh, it steers our behaviors, especially the second stage of theory of mind where you could see yourself from other people's perspective. Uh, because uh, when I work with challenging behavior, as I often do, uh, I actually think that all small children are just, um, uh, uh, all, let's say, standard developed uh, small children are uh, walking challenging behaviors, right? A one year old. So it's, it's quite normal phase in, in development to, to kick someone if you're <laughs> in a bad mood or whatever. And, and all small children have, have behaviors like, uh, every little child I've ever known has picked their nose. Uh, and we don't like that if we're adults. So we tell them not to pick their nose. Uh, and they can maybe um, obey us uh, when we tell them not to, but they have no inner uh, motivation for not picking their nose until a certain uh, development stage, I would say. And that would be the theory of mind where you can see yourself from another person's perspective and realize that they think this is gross and then you have a motivation to not do it. So uh, whenever we see um, uh, what people might call odd behaviors in autism or, or um, challenging behaviors, I think you can just look at it from a developmental pers perspective and not be upset really if you know the de developmental challenging, uh, challenges that are there in uh, autism. Uh, so very often when I <coughs> Uh, counsel in services for uh, uh, high-functioning people with autism, I hear staff saying uh, when something's happened, um, the person has behaved in a certain way, uh, staff will tell the person with autism, you must understand that, and you can fill in whatever, uh, you can't behave like this in this uh, setting or whatever. Um, but the thing is, the person does not understand that. And we can't just uh, use nagging as a way of, <laughs> of helping a person uh, develop um, in that area. So let's go to the toolbox and immediately remove that nagging tool. Uh, because I think, um, I will tell you that as a parent, I have done lots of stupid things that I don't believe in, such as nagging, for example, but that's okay. Because it's, a, it's not a professional relationship. It's a relationship built on love, and it's lifelong, right? Uh, but as professionals, we can't afford that. So if we're professionals, we have to have a professional uh, toolkit. And nagging is not a part of that. Uh, as a matter of fact, about, uh, when I talked about what we can afford, I would like to give you a picture in your head that you can use as a tool. I, think that we must have a trust account uh, with our clients with autism, whether they're stu students or uh, what we call them in our setting. <clears throat> um, when, the client, uh, when the client has autism, uh, we have to keep that account in balance because if we overdraw this account, the person with autism might just not want to have, want to have anything to do with us. So, um, uh, once that happens, we can't help them, right? Uh, uh, to help someone, you have to have their trust. Uh, so, um, since I always know that as a professional, I will make mistakes. I will sometimes even offend someone with autism. Not willingly, but things happen, and it's hard even if I try to be prepared, to always be prepared for everything. So, knowing that, I uh, think that I have to do, put as many deposits as possible in that trust account so I can afford to just um, uh, do a withdrawal now and then without overdrawing the account. So that's a picture I have when I work as a tool in my head when I meet clients with autism. Um, so deliberately working on the relationship, making savings in the trust account uh, is a tool to have in your toolbox. Um, and <clears throat> how do we do that? Well, um, uh, it, the, and this is extra important if we, if we have clients with challenging behaviors, because we have to 
give the person as much possibility as possible to influence their own uh, situation and even influence us, our work, how we approach this person. You know, there is an awful saying, it, it goes like this, give him an inch and he'll take a mile. Uh, my experience is rather offer him a mile and he'll only need an inch. And that's something I think you can also use as a staff because I meet staff who are afraid of just letting go too much or giving the person too much power over things. Uh, I don't think you have to be afraid of that. Um, back then to the use of, of visual aids. Uh, we need them, of course, and we know that, to compensate for the difficulties the person has with theory of mind and other difficulties, of course. Um, with the help of, for example, drawings like uh, uh, comic strip conversations and such, we can explain other people's perspectives to the person with autism. But watch out. Since it's a powerful tool, we need to have ethics here. With tools, we can steer and control uh, people with autism. And that is not our assignment. That's not our job, despite that we do that ever so often. often. So let me tell you a story. It's about a man with autism and Down syndrome. Uh, he has both. He one day came up with the fantastic idea that he wanted um, to have a haircut, a haircut with, you know, a mohawk, a green one, uh, big, uh, like that. And uh, the staff, uh, in, he was living in a group home, and the staff would um, tell him things like, you wouldn't look so good in that. I think another haircut would, would uh, suit you better. What they meant was you might get in trouble with such a haircut, having Down syndrome and maybe be being perceived as different. Um, so I'll give you another tool for your toolbox. I call this tool informed dec decisions. Uh, we let the individual decide, but we are the ones to give the person enough information to make that decision. Uh, we give the person ideas of possible outcomes uh, that some might be upset, some might call him names or being afraid of him out in town, some might think it's cool, right? Too. Uh, so then the person decides if, if he or she is willing to take the risk. We need to take risks as human, be human beings, whether you have autism or not, uh, because that's how we grow. Um, sometimes we fail or make mistakes when we take risks, but we can't learn and grow from, um, from failure if we don't take any risks at all. <clears throat> so a pitfall for, for staff is absolutely that they think they know what is best for their client or student. I hear this from staff all the time. We need to look out for this because um, this is a human mechanism. We all have it. It's one that we have as parents. We think we know what's best for our children. When they are newly born, we have to know what's best for them. But later on, our children normally shows us that we don't know always what's best for them. Uh, so uh, the problem is that our clients with autism or students with autism may awaken that feeling, that parental feeling in us, because we see their, their need for help in situation. Um, but we have to be aware of that <coughs> mechanism and uh, realize that we don't know what's best for them. Uh, you might argue sometimes that they don't either know always what's best for them, and that's sometimes true, but giving them the options they can find out. Another example, uh, we had a woman, uh, she had high functioning autism and, was, and she was 19 years old and she was, a good uh, was good in writing and she had a blog on animal rights with quite a few visitors because it's a subject that many people are interested in. Uh, one day she told the staff that she just came up with a brilliant idea of she was going to post a picture naked of herself on her animal rights blog. So uh, the staff was quite concerned about this because even if she's an adult, she was 19 years old, uh, she, f she felt like not very emotionally mature, maybe more like a 14 or 15 year old. Uh, but still, she's an adult in the meaning of the law so we can't tell her that she can't do that, even 
if my experience is that staff want to do that. Uh, what we did was, uh, by uh, drawing pictures and, and talking to her, giving her examples of outcomes, both positives and negatives, that could happen. She could get comments, uh, maybe not so nice comments about her looks. She could also get nice comments. Nobody knows. We gave her uh, these ideas of what could happen. And then, actually, she decided to do this. She posted this picture. Uh, and both things happen, some nice comments and some not so nice comments on, on this picture. Uh, she took it down after a week, and she had made an experience, actually. Something she learned something from. And I think that many times we as staff just um, uh, not, are not letting people with autism uh, make their own mistakes. Uh, so the informed information, um, uh, the informed choices is a tool we have to uh, uh, use uh, to help people make informed decision, decisions. Sorry. Um, so um, we have two tools here, not only the informed decision tool, we also have the professional reflection tool. That tool has to be used every day. With, reflect with reflection, we can grow as professionals. We have to question ourselves. Uh, uh, and our rationale, why are we doing this? Uh, and uh, we have to question our agenda, uh, agenda maybe we say. Uh, we, I want to give you uh, another example. Uh, uh, in Sweden, I told you to, of a typical staff meeting. Another, uh, one thing I didn't tell you about a typical staff meeting is that we always have coffee. Uh, that is just so. And some people like to take milk in their coffee, right? And if there's not milk in their coffee, uh, for the coffee, it's not just good with coffee, and it's not a good meeting. Uh, so uh, this was a service, a leisure service, for, for young adults with uh, autism. And in this uh, service, they had a little staff meeting before the, the uh, teenagers with, uh, was teenagers with autism would arrive. And uh, at this staff meeting, um, the staff realized they were out of milk. And they only had a short time for the meeting, but the people who wanted milk in their coffee thought that this was so important that it took the time to just go and for, take the car and go and uh, buy co uh, milk for the coffee, right? And uh, then come the teenagers with autism, and then they go out in the woods to grill some hot dogs out in the woods, and they realize that they uh, forgotten the ketchup for the hot dogs, and these teenagers are very upset. They don't want hot dogs if there's no ketchup to go with the hot dogs. And then staff says, well, they have such a problem with changes, and it's good for them to really practice on this, uh, 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 that not everything can go as planned. Uh, so uh, just take a second and think if this could happen in your um, settings as well. I think it could. I think it could happen in almost every setting. And I think the tool we have for this is the reflection tool. What do we do? How do we view? Is there a we and them, right? Of course, there is an actual we and them. If, if we're staff, that's one kind of we. But we don't have to just make this we and them uh, bigger, really. Uh, so we can look at um, how we reason uh, about our clients or students. Um, okay, uh, there are, uh, uh, of course, other reasons to use uh, visual aids. Uh, as you know, uh, people with autism often have problems with communication and language processing. Uh, we all know that. Uh, still, I see often that staff don't understand when the person actually speaks well that they need visual aids uh, anyway. So, in my experience, I meet a lot of people uh, with autism who speak well, but still uh, don't understand as well language as they speak. And I would say that there is actually a kind of echolalia even in high-functioning autism. That is, that you learn phrases uh, and you use them. Uh, so, a young person I uh, knew with autism, she had three phrases she would use uh, in social interaction. So one was, wow, 
it works for most. If someone says something, you can say, wow. Uh, and one was, um, uh, we used that expression in Swedish maybe 15, 20 years ago, uh, but she still uses it, and it's, uh, how was that on a scale from one to 10? Yeah, okay. Uh, and then she had another very typical Swedish expression. Uh, it's that uh, people in the north of Sweden tend to say that. Well, so she had these three, and it worked out well for her in most uh, situations, actually. She would just toss in one of these, and, and people perceived her as very social. And so, yeah. Anyway, one morning, uh, she was 17, on her way to school, she met a class classmate. And this classmate was crying and told her uh, that her uh, grandmother had died. She had just found out that, and she was very sad. So this uh, woman with autism said, wow. And then she realized, no, that's not a good expression. And she said, and how was this on a scale from 1 to 10? <laughs> uh, OK, so after this huge social mistake, she was devastated that she had made such a mistake. And she would actually uh, dwell on this with us in her surroundings a lot. And that's one thing, people, uh, staff I meet who work with, with teenagers or young adults with autism, they, they say to me that uh, they tend to, to dwell on things uh, that has happened and they tend to persevere on this and they, they just go on and on. Uh, but actually, I think, um, uh, you in the audience who don't have autism, some have autism, but some of you don't, have you made social mistakes? Of course, you can't become a grown-up without doing that. Did you dwell on them? Sure you did. I think most people actually, ah, how could I say that? And like everybody else has forgotten this, but you still remember how, how awkward you feel about having made this mistake. So I think people with autism, are no different in many aspects from people who don't have autism. So it's the same mechanism. We tend to dwell on, on social mistakes. And when people have uh, offended us, we also dwell on that. And so do people with autism. So <clears throat> yeah, nothing strange about that. Um, so uh, I don't have... Uh, so much more time, I will uh, not, I promised I wouldn't go over my time for the next speaker. So I just want to give you maybe a couple of other tools. Uh, I think one tool that I have learned to use, I call it transparent communication. Uh, because I think uh, my experience is that people with autism actually pick up and react very much to the unspoken. So uh, if I am very nervous, but I don't want to show that I'm nervous, uh, then uh, they will feel, as will other people too, but my experience is that actually people with autism tend to feel and react to this more than other people. Um, then they will uh, react to this. Uh, so I've learned this um, uh, transparent communication is just to tell them I'm quite nervous. I did that when I was going to meet a man who was, um, had a very severe challenging behavior. Actually, he was locked up in a clinic with the highest security in Sweden where, where you normally put murderers. And, and when I came, this, came there to meet him, the staff just gave me an alarm in my hand and they just said, push this button if something happens. And at that moment, I became very nervous, actually. Uh, and I went into the room alone with this man. Uh, uh, so I told him. Actually, this is what they gave me and what they said. Now I'm very nervous. And he said, relax, I've never hit a woman. <laughs> so, okay, <laughs> I relaxed a little bit. But the point here is I think it's a good idea to just tell them what's going on. Uh, so if you're very tired or upset or irritated, it will show. But the person with autism might not, might not of course, be that good at guessing why. Uh, so, and maybe you don't have to explain why, but tell them that you can do this. And another part of the transparent communication, because that's a question I have gotten from staff who say they feel hijacked by people with autism sometimes who want to talk about their interests for um, hours and hours. 
uh, and, and uh, I know psychologists who, who felt aw awful because she actually fell asleep. Uh, and, and I always think, as a professional, one uh, important uh, part of being professional is knowing when you are at risk of losing your professionali professionality and how to maintain it, right? So if I think that I might become very tired or irritated, because that can happen even if I'm a professional, if someone talks to me three hours about airplanes, it can happen. But then I have to act before that happens, right? Uh, so, I actually do uh, uh, interrupt people with autism sometimes, uh, but then I tell them I do that. That's transparent communication. I'm saying, I'm interrupting you now because, and I tell them why. We need to talk about this, or if we go on, I might fall asleep, or whatever. Uh, so, we can come back to this later. So, um, this is also part of the professionality. And uh, then, uh, another <coughs> tool that I think uh, is useful, one, it has been very useful for me anyway, it's um, uh, the solution-focused strategies. Uh, and uh, solution-focused, it's you, often under the name of solution-focused therapy, uh, SFT, but it's just like, a, uh, let's say it's a toolkit. It's not spe specifically for autism. Uh, so if you work with people with autism, you have to adapt it. Uh, but especially in working with staff, I find it very useful. Uh, because uh, we can backtrack things from another perspective with staff. Uh, I meet staff who say, well, they have a, a, a client that is very difficult with severe challenging behavior. And they say, nothing works. Uh, and it's so difficult, and okay, but we have to start somewhere. And they are so used to looking at what does not work. So with the solution-focused strategies, we, will, we look at what do work. When does it work? Uh, even if it just works once a month for two seconds, what's the um, uh, uh, conditions during that time? Who is present? Who is, so we can, uh, I'm not saying we shouldn't look at the difficulties and the problems, but we also need uh, this uh, way of looking at why does it work, when it works, and how can we do more of that. So that is actually a tool set that I uh, am very happy that it came into my life. It's helped me a lot, uh, um, counseling staff and uh, meeting people with autism. For example, I used it uh, with a, a young man with autism who had lived uh, in a care setting, um, and um, he was this kind of person that you sometimes meet with autism, not sure not everybody is like that, but he was totally negative about everything. Uh, if he said something, it was always something negative. Uh, and uh, the staff was not good, and the food was not good, and nothing was good. Still the staff saw he, he was making progress. But it was difficult, of course, it's difficult at staff if the person always tell you everything is, you see progress, but the person doesn't see it in, himself. So uh, when he was leaving that setting, actually positively to live more independently, uh, I had a talk with him because I knew him, and I used uh, the solution focus, some strategies uh, to ask him, um, what would he, this is actually the scale from, from zero to 10, so I asked him where would he put this time? And he said an eight. <laughs> I was shocked. An eight, really, that was. And then we just talked about what made it an eight, what was good, and then he could put it into words for the first time. So it's a good toolkit. Uh, okay, uh, so I just have a few minutes left and I have to pick up my cliffhanger. Uh, I promised you that. Uh, so, um, what did I have? Well, uh, I told you my son does not have autism. Uh, he had actually, I, I watched him because I know autism. So, uh, he had no traits whatsoever, I would say, of, of autism or of ADHD or any other neuropsychiatric uh, disorder until he was eight years old. When he suddenly... Uh, 
during the course of two weeks would ful fulfill uh, diagnostic criteria for five psychiatric Ill illnesses, including psychosis, uh, at an eight-year-old. Uh, it was devastating and difficult to see. Uh, and uh, as a mother, I finally, by myself, uh, found out that this was a disorder called PANDAS, Pediatric Autoimmune Neuropsychiatric Dis Disorder Associated with Streptococci Infection. And my son is now, thank you, treated and he's symptom-free uh, since three years, but he was ill for two years and he is uh, back to his old self now. Uh, I realized I had a severe uh, scarlet fever, which is streptococci infection at two and a half. Uh, and I think I had pandas, now that I know so much about pandas. And I think there is an overlap between autism and pandas. Uh, can't tell you because it's not researched yet how many, but there is. You can have autism first and you can get pandas on top of it, uh, which happens to some. Uh, usually then it's severe OCD or it's hallucinations or something like that that will add on. Or you can have uh, you can have nothing first and then uh, get pandas and if it's not treated and you get it as a young person, it may in almost everything look like autism or be autism. I'm not sure what autism is really anymore. What I am sure of is that with all the new knowledge of uh, how the immune system play a role in, in all psychiatry, not just neuropsychiatry, I think these fields must come together. Uh, and uh, um, yeah, I think um, some do only have autism and, or only pandas, some are, have right diagnosis, some have the wrong diagnosis, I'm not sure. Of course, the important thing is that person get access to the right help. Uh, but I'm also absolutely want to be clear with that, sure that there are people with autism who don't have pandas, so I don't think everything is <coughs> pandas. But I think I had it. And I don't have more time to explain this to you. And I know some of you have heard of pandas before. For others, it might be totally new. But then you have your best friend Google, right? Uh, so you can look for pandas. And uh, uh, you don't want to look at the uh, Asian beers. Uh, you want to look to at pandas together with Streptococci or maybe together with the name Susan Swedo, the American doctor who, who uh, discovered this in the 90s. So uh, maybe I have to write a new autobiography. The facts are uh, still there. I experienced it like this, but maybe it wasn't autism, but it, it could have been pandas. I think so. So um, I will now um, leave room for the next speaker. Thank you. <laughs>